good evening everyone uh, so we are meeting here for photography workshop there are few uh, workshop housekeeping room i'll just say them uh, once this entire session is being recorded and is scheduled for two hours this is two days workshop so you have to attend tomorrow's session at the same time this is a webinar mode so only panelists will be speaking you can post your question in chat box or q and a section we will be uh, logging all questions and answer them during q and a session so we have with us mr raghav gupta who is an indian revenue uh, service officer of 2012 batch and belongs to kanpur he completed his master in taxation and business law from nalsar university hyderabad based and advanced diploma in international taxation and chartered institute from taxation london mr gupta secured an all indian rank of 102 in the 2011 civil services examination he was posted at mumbai for 5 years and held various assignment he is currently posted as as deputy director of income tax investigation department in kanpur mr gupta's childhood love for uh, wildlife na uh, naturally turned into photography about 10 years back since then he has constantly tried to improve his craft he has written for various magazines and newspaper including the hindus sevas uh, sanctuary asians and other he is a lifetime member of bombay natural history society and was recently appointed as advisory member of erds foundation which is undertaking a great indian bustard uh, conservation program always a learner mr gupta completed a comprehensive course of ornithology offered by cornell university and the exploring conservation course offered by national geography to his writing and photography he has spread awareness about wildlife diversity and conservation across the uh, country to various webinar his other interests include astronomy egyptology writing poetry and teaching so let's get started without wasting more time i would now welcome mr raghav uh, gupta to take the session ahead welcome mr raghav and over to you thank you ms arju and welcome all the participants to this uh, today workshop uh, in these two days i hope to able to you know inspire you to write to click better photographs and hope to conserve this beautiful environment with the amazing biodiversity and wildlife which uh, our country is blessed with so uh, before we move on i'll quickly uh, you know give an idea of what we'll be uh, looking at in these next two days so day one that is today we'll be looking at the photography basics some photo stories to understand how photos can you know communicate and how they can narrate stories and inspire people to conserve environment and save the wildlife we'll be looking at photography ethics that is what is the right way to click photographs what are what is to be to be done what is not to be done and then we have a small assignment for uh, you know kids and everybody else who wants to participate along with interactive session that's day one tomorrow we'll be looking at some courses and careers in wildlife and environment we'll be looking at how work life balance can be maintained we'll be discussing the assignment which we'll be doing today and there'll be an interactive session so before we begin i'll take a quick poll and uh, just to get an idea of uh, which age group do we have you know people from so you can go to menti.com m e n t i.com and there uh, i'll just share the screen can you uh, see the screen everybody arju can we yes i just missed it great so everybody can go to menti.com m e n t i .com and there you enter the code 8599180 arju will be putting that code also i think in the chat box for everybody to see and once you get that code you will have this question yes so we can see we have some responses i think uh, kids these days are already using menti so so you can uh, click on that and keep entering your responses on menti.com and so we'll have an idea of uh, which age group so that we have got around 25 26 responses and we have 211 participants so that's just 10% so we want more numbers yes great you can wait for a couple of minutes just to have an idea all right so we have a majority in the age group of 11 to 15 that's great to know 
others who are in the other group, we have the second number, we have uh, age group uh, greater than 24. So we have extremes. We have the young ones and, you know, slightly older than them. Great. Notes are coming. We'll take an, another minute or two. Aju, is that okay? Absolutely, so that is fine. Right. I think it's the speed is stopping now. Most people have gotten it. Menti.com. If people haven't got it still, it's m m e n t i dot c o m. Menti. It's it's available on the slide also. And all you need to do is enter the code eight five double nine one eight zero to participate in this poll. And then we'll have an idea of uh, which you know age group we have largely. Great. So I think we can take a pause now. We have enough responses. We have an idea now, I think. What do you think, Aju? We can take a screenshot maybe or save the results? Yes, we can take a screenshot yeah. as well. Right. All right. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, taking part in this. We are closing the voting now. Great. Thank you. All right, so moving on, now that we know uh, which age group we have, we can now again start the presentation. Just give me a second. All right, so can you see the presentation now? Back again, quick poll. Is it visible? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So let's move on. So now that we know uh, which age group we have, so I'll try to you know uh, speak in a language which everybody can uh, hopefully understand. We'll talk about photography basics first. Like what do we look at in a photograph? How do we click better photos? So the first thing we look at is something called exposure. Exposure is basically a sum of three things. It is the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. The slightly technical words, but let's quickly have a look at them. The aperture basically is, an, is a part of the camera which helps you to understand how much light enters into the camera. And this is a denominator, as you can see, f by 1.4, f by 4, f by 8, etc. So you can understand that the more, the bigger the denominator is, the smaller the number is, right? which means that if you have a larger aperture, it will have a small denominator. And the larger aperture means a bigger hole. So you have a more light entering into the camera. That is aperture. Shutter speed is basically controlling how long the light will enter into the camera. So since we're talking about how long, we are measuring it in time. So that means in seconds, you can have one second, one by two hundredth of a second, a fraction, which is very less, maybe one by thousandth of a second, etc. So this means that it is only for that amount of time which the shutter will open, let the light come in and then close back again. So you can understand that if the shutter speed is very high, that means it will open and close very soon. So it will allow very little light to come in, right? And the third part is the ISO. The ISO controls the sensitivity to light, which means that it will control how much of the light is being sensed by the camera sensor. It could be a phone, a camera phone sensor, it could be a digital camera, it could be a DSLR, any kind of camera. So these three factors basically comprise what is called as the exposure. Now, moving on from this, besides these three factors which we discussed, the aperture also controls the depth of field. This is a technical concept. We look at some photos and you'll understand. It's very simple. And the shutter speed controls the motion blur, while the ISO is related to the noise. So if you have higher ISO, which is typically used in a low light situation. So for example, you are in a jungle or in a forest where, it, where it, the light is very low. So you would increase the ISO in your camera so that your photo doesn't get underexposed. And similarly, if, if you have a very fast moving object, let's say a tiger is running or a bird is flying and you need to uh, capture a very sharp photo, then you need to have a very high shutter speed so that you can instantly capture that particular moment. So more, much of theory is actually uh, you know, illustrated by examples. So I'll give you an example. This bird is a black belly tern. It's a rare bird, very endangered, and it is found uh, typically in the rivers of India, like Chambal, for instance. 
Now here, what we've done is there's a very large aperture. And what you will see is in the background, there's no background, which is clearly visible. It is blurred completely. So this means that this is a very shallow depth of field, which means that only a particular object is coming into your depth of field and everything else is blurred. So what happens is because of this, your object, whichever their object it could be a wildlife, it could be an animal, it could be a, another object that tends to shine because the other thing is all blurred out. So this is achieved by having a large aperture. Moving on to this example, this is um, something called the Dalmatian Pelican. And then this is captured in Nalsavar, Gujarat. So as you can see here, the shutter speed is very high, but the aperture is much smaller. And why is that? This day was a very bright day, very sunny. So had I put the aperture very large, what would have happened? Light would have entered, too much light, light would have entered and the bird would have been overexposed. You would not be able to see the, the finer details of the white wings, which are clearly visible now. But because of opening of the, uh, you know, uh, the aperture, which was lessened, you can now see the background very clearly. In the previous photo, the background was not visible because the aperture was too large. Here, the aperture is too small. So now you have a larger depth of field because now you can go beyond the bird and see there's some vegetation in the background, there's some water in the background, etc. At the same time, you'll see that the shutter speed is very high. In this case, it was one, uh, F, uh, sorry, one by 64 hundredth of a second, which is a very, very tiny amount of time. And why was that relevant? Again, because it was sunny. And two, because I wanted to capture these beautiful water droplets. Had the shutter speed been a little lower, then the droplets would have been blurred and the picture wouldn't have been so clear. So this is an example to show how exposure should be balanced and that will help you create a better photo. And moving on to the second point after exposure, there's something called the framing and rule of thirds. Now this is slightly interesting. So just pay a little attention and you'll get it. What you need to do is you'd need to draw two horizontal and two vertical lines like this. As you can see, the image has been divided into nine equal parts. So when you are taking a picture, through your camera or through your mobile phone, try imagining there are nine equal parts of that photograph. What next? The point of interest, that is the point or the particular object or the particular uh, part of an object which you want to highlight in your photograph should be lying on the intersecting points of these nine lines like this. So you can have four possible points. You can have the top left, the, 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 the top right, the bottom left and the bottom right. So what is happening is that you have nine lines Nine, sorry, nine squares and any of these points you can base your image or your object on. We'll see an example then you'll understand how. The second point in the same rule of thirds is that when you have these two lines, the broad horizontal lines, this is where the horizon of the image should lie. That means, for example, let's say you're on a beach and you want to capture a photo of the sky and the land. So what would you do? You would try to divide the photo exactly in half and half, right? You would say that let's let's take a picture with half the sky and half the land or half the sea, whichever you know photo you want to take. But that is actually not the right way to go about it. You should try positioning the horizon on either the top line or the bottom line so that one third of it is on either way. We'll see how. This rule of thirds of framing is valid for both portrait as well as landscape framing. And also very importantly, when you're taking a picture, try leaving some space for the subject to interact with. Again, we'll see what that means. This is an example. This beautiful bird is the Oriental Dwarf Kingfisher. It's not really a rare bird, but very rarely seen because it's found in the forests and rivers of uh, you know, Western Ghats. So now what happens is you can see that if we divide this photograph into nine equal squares, what is happening is that I wanted to highlight the eye of the bird and the insect. So it is placed on the top left corner, if I try to use a laser maybe. So you can see that this area, as you can see, is what I'm trying to put the bird on, right? Then you'll also see that the twig, the, the branch on which the bird is placed is forming a horizon. So it is on the bottom line. It could have been on the top line also, but I chose to, for it to be on the bottom. And what else do you see? You see that this entire part of the image is blank. It is entirely free. So normally what would we do? We try to position the image right in the center, but that's not really the way to do it. The right way would be to shift the bird a little to the right. So it looks as if the bird is going to fly to the right area or maybe looking at the right area, maybe looking for another insect. That's how this negative space, this, this particular part is called the negative space. And the negative space helps to increase the aesthetics, the beauty of your image. So then let's take another example. 
Here's a black buck from the outskirts of Nasik in Maharashtra. As you can see, it's a beautiful creature. And here is the nine, the, the rule of thirds. What do you see? You see that the animal or the head of the animal is the main part of the animal, which I want to highlight. That is placed on the intersecting point. You will also see that the horizon here, where the land is sort of ending, is all nearly on that line. But remember, these are just guidelines. They're not supposed to be followed exactly to the point. Doesn't have to mean that the line has to exactly follow that particular line which you're talking about, right? It could be around that just to get a sense of that proportion. Another example, here's a beautiful sunrise from Arunachal Pradesh. And as you can see, it's from Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary, one of my favorite places to go to. And you'll see again that the sun is slightly on the left side. Why is that important? Again, look at the rule of thirds. Here we have the sun on the intersecting point, right? There is no horizon, so the horizontal lines really don't play much of a role here. Now let's compare this same photograph had it been taken in the center. Which one do you think is better? I personally feel that this photo is better than this one because the sun should not be in the center. This does not fall with the two rule of third proportion, right? So this also is an example. Here's an example which breaks the rule of third. This beautiful bird is the orange-billed blue magpie. This was in the outskirts of Shimla, Himachal Pradesh. Now, as you can see, the rule of third is not being followed here. Why? The bird or the eye of the bird is not following on the intersection lines. There is the horizon, which could have been the bird's tail, but that is also not you know, falling on a line. And yet it sort of appealed to me because I wanted to fit the entire bird you know, in, the, in the frame and not leave any negative space also, right? So as you can see, this photograph breaks the rule of thirds. So this exactly is what I'm trying to tell you, that the rule of thirds is a guideline. You should you know, try to look at your photographs and see when you're capturing, you can try experimenting. Let's see the rule of thirds. Maybe it could you know, work out very well, or in this case, it may not need to. So it is, that's how the, work, you know, uh, the rule of uh, framing goes on. Here's another example, which is an uh, example of a portrait form that the others were landscapes. So again, you can see the same rule can be followed. You divide the photo again into nine equal parts. And as you can see, the bird's eye and the face is lying on the intersection. This is a very common bird called the purple sunbird, and it has been captured in Jaisalmer, Rajasthan. So that is broadly the, you know, the idea of what uh, needs to be looked at. You have the exposure, which is the technical part, and you have the framing or rule of thirds, which is the aesthetics part. Broadly speaking, these two are the most important tools for any kind of photograph. So once you have a mastery over them, this comes with time, you'll, you'll see that your photographs are you know, getting better and you'll be able to communicate better. Now, before we just move on to the communication part, I'll quickly run through what different types of photography we can have. And we'll take up some examples in which we'll see the rule of third and some other you know, important, interesting points which we should follow. So broadly, we can have night photography, macro photography and backlit photography. These are sort of the technical basis of classification. We can have conservation and experimental photography, which is a thematic classification, or we could have landscape and portrait photography, which is the frame-based classification. So this list of classifications is not really you know, rule-bound. It is not found in any book. It is just out of you know, experience. And once you see that most of the photographs which you see would tend to fall in any of these categories, or maybe more. You could have, let's say, a backlit uh, experimental photograph. You could have a night portrait. You could have a macro or a, you know a macro which is backlit for instance so you can have many combinations possible right so we look at night photographs this very interesting bird looks like an owl and it's in fact closely related to an owl also it's called a night jar and this is from Thattikar, kerala this is the gray the great haired uh, night jar and as you can see this uh, photo was taken in the night now the important thing is when you're taking a night photograph make sure that the object is not fully in your torchlight or flashlight. This is wrong for a couple of reasons. Number one is that typically when you're, uh, let's say, um, you know, capturing nocturnal creatures, let's say like a bird or an animal or a mammal, then these creatures are very sensitive to light. So if you're flashing flashlights or torchlights on them, they might temporarily get blinded and they might not be able to save themselves from predators or they may not be able to, let's say, search for food. So both of these examples are detrimental to their health. Therefore, it is very important that we do not flash the light directly into the eyes. As you can see, this bird is very comfortably looking at me without shutting its eyes because the light is not falling directly on it. Where do you think the light is falling? Look slightly on the right side of the image. I'll quickly you know, show it for the laser. There you see. You see the leaf in the background, it is shining white. That is where the focus of the light was, slightly on the right side. So what that does is, 
a it is not shining on the light on the on the bird so the bird doesn't get disturbed and b you get good colors if you shine the same light directly on the bird then besides hurting the bird you will hurt your image as well because your photo will tend to be overexposed you will lose the colors of the browns and the grays and the blacks which are so clearly visible now will not be visible if you directly shine the light on the bird so that is an example of night photograph here is another thrilling example which i encountered in nasik this is a golden jackal and we were you know searching for night birds like the night jar and the owls and suddenly i heard a sound in the fields and I, we were you know scared that what is it because it sounded something big so we were worried that you know what kind of creature it would be and just when we were about to turn right in front of us this jackal you know it had sensed that we are there and it had, it was just walking towards us and again you'll see that the light is not focused directly on the jackal's eyes it is focused slightly on the left so this is why you can see the golden color of the jackal very very uh, you know a thrilling image directly looking into the camera because the lights were not directly shining on it so this is uh, the crucial part to remember when you're taking night photographs how about macro photographs so macro photography is basically you know looking at the tiny world let's say you have butterflies dragonflies tiny little flowers these kind of photographs are best taken by macro photographs and macro photography here's an example this is a dragonfly a superb uh, you know creature this is the variegated flutterer also called the com common picture wing and this was taken in navi mumbai maharashtra and it was a rainy day and just when the rain had stopped the, the sun came up and thankfully this you know dragonfly was on the on a leaf drying its wings and uh, that's where the sun shone and you can see the beautiful uh, you know patchwork uh, looking like stained glass on the dragonfly right this is an example of a macro and a macro shot can be very easily taken from mobile phones so in fact those people who are interested in these kind of photographs you can all you need to do is borrow your mom and dad's phone or if you have if you're lucky if you have your own then click some photographs and you know you, these are visible very uh, you know easily anywhere you have dragonflies and butterflies which are very common you can have many kind of insects and you can have your own collection of insects and try to understand what kind of biodiversity of insects do you have in your own garden or your locality or the building which you live in there's a lot of you know scope in macro photographs so this is just one example so macro photography is another genre of photography which can really help understand the the tiny little world which we normally don't uh, you know see and it can highlight certain very interesting aspects then we have something called the backlit photography now backlit photography means as we just spoke about the night photograph we, we said that the light should typically fall on the subject which means that when we are trying to take a picture of any object it could be a animal a bird a, a flower or a, a plant anything then what do we normally want we want light falling on the object but there's a very different technique what if the light is behind the object that also creates a very different kind of photograph right and you can have a very interesting kind of colors some kind of textures and here's an example this is a blue bottle butterfly again in mumbai maharashtra and as you can see that the shadow of the butterfly is falling in front of it which means that the sun was behind it and that is why you can have this translucent very interesting color showing to you otherwise had it had the light been on the other side on the usual side then it would have been a normal blue color but here it looks like a translucent very different kind of texture imagine you have a monkey or a gorilla right and the sun is behind it what would you expect you'd expect the hair of the gorilla standing out beautifully against the sunlight that is an example of backlit photography this also is an example to illustrate how your subjects can uh, tend to be very interesting and very different moving on to something called the conservation and environmental photography this perhaps is the most important type of photography which is why we should really get into the whole field of photography if you are interested in environment and wildlife so what does this do as the name suggests this helps you to understand and help others understand what the challenges for the environment are what kind of conservation measures we can take and what uh, are the latest risks uh, which are driving certain let's say creatures to extinction so again examples with clarify these are beautiful birds called the flamingos and this is from uh, you know in, in again a place in mumbai uh, outskirts of mumbai and as you can see there's a lot of construction activity going there's a human activity there and the birds are very happily you know uh, feeding here staying here but till when that is the question and that is what this photograph tells you a story it shows that these birds are fine now but what happens if the industrial waste if toxic material 
if let's say landfilling, et cetera, destroys this uh, habitat, what happens then? So this is a challenge. This is how you, uh, you know, through your photograph, you can communicate, but what kind of challenges which a species like the fengos face? Here's another example. This little bird is called the Eurasian curlew. And you can see that has a huge beak. I'll try to magnify this part. Yeah. So if you can see, it has a very long curved beak, probably one of the largest beaks uh, to body ratio in the bird, in the bird kingdom. And as you can see that in the background, there's a boat, there's a human activity. Typically, this beach is uh, normally you know, clean. This is Arnala Beach, again in Maharashtra. And, and, and you can see that the beach is normally clean. But when I went there, it was stinking because of human activity and waste. So, and these birds are coming uh, in the winter season. They're coming from far off lands, from Russia, from Central Asia, other places. And they're here as our guests. So what does, it, what does it imply for us? What do we do for these birds, which are treating these lands as their own? And you know, aren't they guests for us? So as responsible citizens, we should do, try to make sure that the beaches are clean, at least for those three, four periods, three, four months, so that these birds are able to feed properly and not ingest toxic or you know, harmful chemicals and make their journey back to their homelands. Here's the same bird and in a very different setting. So this is a contrast which I want to show that there you had human activity and here because of lack of human activity, you have so many of them comfortably sitting, sleeping, talking to each other, maybe who knows. And this is an example to show that the same Eurasian curlews in a given uh, you know, habitat can so comfortably stay and uh, survive. And here's again a black buck but in a very different setting. This is in Bah, which is near Agra in Uttar Pradesh. And as you can see that the, it, it is you know, looking at me in the camera and just trying to understand where to go. Why is that? You see those sticks all around? They have barbed wires on them. And what are barbed wires? Barbed wires are those you know, iron uh, um, wires which are tied across the fields so that people you know, don't interfere and, and you know, creatures don't come in or go out, etc. But this creature is not sure of that because the, the, the size of the bushes or the, or the crop is too high. And a lot of times, black bugs like this get trapped in those uh, barbed wires, killing themselves. So this is an example to show how conservation photography can highlight these challenges. So what we need to do, we could probably have colored tapes or something of those sort, which can be seen by the animal. It does not need to be necessarily you know, uh, so, uh, so uh, violent in its construction. So that's an example. Here's another interesting example. So what do you see? You see these birds, these seabirds called seagulls. And this is in Mumbai. Many of you who are from that region or have visited Mumbai can probably recognize this. This is the marine drive. And this is a common site in winters. What is happening is this looks normal, but do you see on the left side, there's, there's a hand and that hand is throwing something. It's throwing some food. So why is that a problem? Why do you think that, that could be an issue? It doesn't look like an issue, right? But when we talk about it, we'll see how many levels this, this could go wrong. First and foremost, the kind of food which we normally feed birds, let's say, um, you know, um, uh, namkeen or biscuits, all of this is not really meant for the system. The digestive system is entirely different. And this kind of food does not really suit their bodies. So that is the, the first thing which we're doing wrong. Secondly, this kind of, uh, you know, dependence, as you can see, many of these birds are juveniles, which means they're young. They're just learning to uh, understand how to fish, how to catch fish, etc. But what is happening here is we are telling them to be dependent on us. We're telling them, no, you forget your fishes, you forget your hunting, you come to us, we'll feed you. So what do the birds feel? Birds say, okay, we have easy food. Why do we need to go to the sea? We'll rather feed here. They don't understand that what is going to eventually happen is these young birds will never understand the nuances of fishing. And what is going to happen is one day when such kind of food is not available, they will not be able to survive themselves. And let's say, for example, they travel back to their homelands. Do you think there will be there somebody feeding them there? No. And what do they do then? They will not be able to hunt, they will not be able to fish, and they'll end up starving and dying. And this entire population could collapse just because of this small gesture, which we think is kindness. But really, that's what I call this photograph. Sometimes kindness can kill. And this is what it is. So we should always ensure that we do not feed wild animals because wild animals, besides uh, the food not being suitable for them, we are creating a dependence on them. And this dependence is very unhealthy. And the third and last point is, because of this dependence or because of this habitual uh, feeding, these birds, for example, this is okay. This is fine because they are you know, coming, coming to urban habitats. What happens if the same kind of uh, creatures are, let's say, existing in the forest? Then what is going to happen is they'll eventually venture into human habitation. And this will cause man-animal conflict. 
uh, or even that, or maybe that they become domesticated, they could become, they, their habit, habits could change and entire populations could entirely uh, be wiped out from the wild. So this small gesture, which many of us may not even think so much about is actually having long-term repercussions. So we have to be very careful. And as young people, this is what you should understand that feeding wild animals, be it squirrels, be it uh, pigeons is not really good. So we should avoid that. Next, of course, we have experimental photography. And this kind of photography is when you want to take something which is non-conventional, when you want to say that, okay, I don't want to follow the rule of thirds, I don't want to follow the aperture, I don't want to follow the exposure, and I just want to create something very different. But you can do that as well. And here's an example. This is the glossy iris. It is taken from uh, Nandur Madhyameshwar, Maharashtra. And as you can see that here, the, the, you know, the birds are uh, sort of fighting with each other and the droplets are you know, flying all around and the, the wings are slightly blurred. Now, why, did, why, why is that needed? Why do we need a blurred kind of uh, photograph? Well, the reason is it sort of gives a sense of motion. If, you, if I had increased the shutter speed to uh, maybe a little bit more, then it would have been a much sharper photo. You know, the wings would have been much clearer, the droplets would have been even more clearer, and maybe it would have been interesting. But I just wanted to experiment. I just wanted to see, okay, let's, let's take a little lesser shutter speed and let's see how the wings turn out. And as you can see that the wings are not very clear, but it's giving a sense of dynamism to the photo. It's as if those two are fighting in the moment and you can see that kind of tension building up. So that is a kind of example of experimental photography where the rules don't matter and you can instantly create your own kind of creation, which, has, which could communicate something entirely different or unexpected. And a lot of it depends on your patience and on, on your, you know, the thought process, your understanding. Here's another example of experimental photography. Here is, we have the gray uh, Malabar hornbill or the Malabar gray hornbill, which is from Dandeli, Karnatak. And you can see it's beautifully camouflaged in this fig tree. You know, the, the fruit is all uh, uh, laden and it's magically disappeared into the, into the uh, tree. And the reason why it's experimental is typically we would want this photo to stand out on a perch and with a blurred background so that the, you know, the, the bird is very clear and there's, there's no distraction. But here I wanted something different. I wanted to capture the bird in its own element where it was happy in the evening and you know, just blitz, blissfully eating away. So this is also an example of how you can narrate stories by your photograph. Here you're, you are just selling, telling that, look at the bird, it's so happy. It doesn't it really, you know, it thinks it's hidden and it's eating away to glory. And you can have this in very interesting photograph, which is not following the rule of thirds and not typically following the usual uh, conventional uh, kind of photograph. Moving on to the next type of photography, which is landscape. And landscape photography, as we say, uh, is basically, what is landscape? It is a vast area. Sometimes it's called the wildscape when you're trying to capture an animal with it. So landscape could be a wild, uh, could be a forest, it could be a, a grassland, it could be desert, it could be snow, it could be mountains. The list is endless. You can have a very kind of, very different kind of landscapes. So what do these landscape photography, uh, you know, aim to do? It aims to highlight the natural habitat, the natural home of the animal or the environment which you're trying to highlight. So an example shows this beautiful bird. It may not look so beautiful, but to me, it's one of the most amazing birds which I've seen. It's called the Great Indian Buster, the GIB. And this is taken from Jaisalmer, the Desert National Park. Park. This bird, uh, friends, is one of the rarest birds in India. There's just about 100 of them left. Many of them have died because of transmission wires, because of dogs, because of uh, poaching, because of their habitat, which is shrinking gradually. And so here it was, you know, uh, we, 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 this was the fourth day I had gone to uh, Jaisalmer to sort of look for this bird. And three, four days had gone and, and we had no idea uh, when we would see this bird. So we didn't. And right at the end, when the, you know, the car was turning, the guide with us said Godavan. And Godavan is the name, the local name of this bird. And that's where we, you know, the car stopped and we just had to look at the bird where it was. It was very far. But there it is, the huge bird walking very proudly across the desert. So here you can see the landscape. You can see that the desert in the background, you have some keycard and babool trees, which are typical of deserts. You have the rocky kind of sandy kind of area, which the bustard prefers to, where it, you know, captures insects, etc. So this bird is endangered and, uh, you know, things are happening. We're trying to, a lot of organizations are trying to help it out and hopefully things will get better. Here's another example of landscape. And you can see, this is again, Nandur Madhyameshwar. You'll see on the right side, there's a bird called the purple heron. And on the left side, you'll see a golden jacal. And you can see that the bird is very, you know, highly erect. Its neck is very high up and it has already spotted some movement 
on the other side. The jackal thinks it's not being spotted. It's trying to hunt it. In fact, there are three jackals there here. You can only see one here. There's the, there's another one which is on the right side of the photo. I couldn't capture it. And there's another one on the behind, you know, on the, the vegetation which is behind the first jackal. So they had coordinated this attack, trying to you know hunt down this bird. And what happened next was the bird had spotted the movement and it quickly flew away. But the idea is the landscape. You can see a lot of water here. It's a wetland area. You have grasses, you have trees, you have you know aquatic vegetation, water hyacinths, for example. All of this highlights a kind of natural habitat which these animals are inhabiting. And the last kind of category is the portrait photographs. So what is portrait? Portrait is probably the most standard kind of photographs you see, even in usual non-wildlife photography, when you're taking photos of yourself or your relatives or your friends, they are typically portraits. And Here's an example of a portrait, a very common animal called the rhesus monkey. And here it was just right at my home, not very far away, but I just had this interesting you know, expression which I wanted to capture. So portraits typically help you highlight the humanness which the animals can exhibit or some kind of various uh, you know, uh, characteristics which are unique to that animal. Here's another example of a portrait. And this is the red or the crimson backed sunbird. And this interesting bird is very tiny, and it is found only in India, in fact, only in the Western Ghats. It's endemic to Western Ghats. And I was lucky that this photograph was actually chosen as the cover for the Hornbill magazine. And Hornbill is one of the you know, renowned magazines for BNHS, uh, Bombay Natural History Society. And this is where we highlight how such birds, you know, they're typically flitting around. It's very difficult to capture, very tiny, very uh, fast moving bird. But then what happened was it came for a second in the sunlight, looked at me and went back again. And that, thankfully, that moment I could capture. Here's another example of the vulture, the, the griffon vulture. You have the cinereus vultures there as well. And this looks like a very ghastly sight. You know, vultures are not normally regarded as, uh, you know, uh, epitomes of beauty, but here they are. And I feel that they are magnificent creatures. But besides their magnificence or grandeur, there's something even more important to understand about vultures. And this everybody should understand, especially people who, are, who haven't probably seen vultures. There was a time, if you ask your parents, especially the young uh, kids who were here, you could probably ask your parents or grandparents and they'll tell you that, yeah, we used to see vultures in our, you know, in our childhood. And you ask them now, when, when was the last time we saw a vulture? And the answer would be, it's been ages, it's been years since we saw it. Why do you think that has happened? This is what the problem is. This is how we understand, uh, you know, uh, complicated issues can entirely change food chains. And I'll just narrate how this happened. So what happens is there's something called, there's a medicine called diclofenac. And diclofenac is fed to buffaloes and you know, other bovine creatures, typically as a, used as a painkiller. Now what happens is you know that the vultures feed on dead bodies. That is, they, they feed on dead animals. Once they're dead, they, they feed on it and they clean up the body. So what used to happen was that these vultures, which were numerous, they were in millions in, in the entire South Asian continent, right from India, Asia, India, uh, you know, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Thailand, all these countries. And all of them have been uh, typically reduced to hundreds and thousands now because of the same reason that the diclofenac drug, which was found in these buffaloes and cattle, was found to be fatal for these vultures. They, it caused an immediate failure in the liver and other multiple organ failures, and the, uh, the birds started dying in huge numbers. And that there came a time when there was a, a certain drop around 1990s when the birds precipitously dropped. And that is when it was finally found as, that these birds, what was the cause of these birds dying? And thankfully, because of researchers, they find, found out because of this drug that these you know, birds had been wiped out, uh, nearly wiped out. And what happened because of that? Have you noticed that there's a, you know, a very large increase of dogs in your area? And many of these dogs are becoming feral, ferocious. Why do you think that is happening? Because these, the vultures, were the natural scavengers of our food chain. There were so many in number, they could have finished bodies and ensured that there was no infection which was arising. Why do you think things like avian influenza is happening? Why do you think things like uh, swine flu are happening? These are you know, examples uh, to show that because of the in, uh, you know, inefficient disposal of these bodies, these dead bodies tend to be feasting grounds for various kinds of bacteria, which have a huge chance to evolve and you know, multiply and spread all across the community. This was never a problem when vultures were there because they would finish the entire thing right to the bone, making sure that there was no bacteria left. And they had very efficient digestive systems. They would have, you know, without any problems to them. But dogs are not like that. Dogs, you know, it, eat in bits and pieces. They leave those things festering away. And because of that, there are various kinds of infections which are, you know, plaguing the entire human humanity. And this is an example to show what a small drug would do 
to this entire population. But hope is not lost. We have many different breeding centers, especially by BNHS in Haryana, in, in, I think, Orissa, in Bengal, and other places where these vultures have been bred. You know, young vultures were uh, raised there. And for the first time, very recently, they have been left out in the wild to understand whether they will survive in the wild or not. So their breeding population has increased. And now we are seeing a large increase in their numbers. And thankfully, in the future, we'll hopefully be able to see a better you know, size of, of, the, of their population. And by the way, the drug has been banned now. So it doesn't, it's not a concern, but we have to be careful anyway. Here's another portrait, a classic portrait of a leopard. And this was in Jalana, Rajasthan. And uh, it was dusk. As you can see, the color of the leopard is not typically what you see. And the reason is because of the, of the, of the dusk. And you can see that the face is not very clear. The face looks to be a different color than the body. And that's because there was a twig right in front of its face. And this was a split second moment. So you have to understand that in wildlife, there are many moments which you feel that, okay, I, I need to capture this in a particular way, but you don't have that much of time because the animal is not waiting for you. It'll just look at you, probably pose for a second and go. So that's exactly what happened. It had looked at me and I wanted to capture that right moment when it was looking directly into the, into the camera. And that's where I captured it. Had I moved here or there, it probably would have gone or you know, the contact would have been you know, different. So this is also an example of a portrait. Your photos don't have to be perfect, but they need to communicate some kind of sense, some kind of you know, intensity in that photograph. So that brings us to the end of uh, the first part, which is long part. I hope I'm not boring people. And uh, now we look at photo stories. And photo stories are basically you know, uh, what we've been talking about in, in the past few photos, how photographs can communicate and tell you uh, what kind of uh, you know, experience are we looking at. And maybe the photographs themselves will speak and let you know how you can uh, write and how you can understand about different kinds of photos. And the first one is called the family. And by the way, these captions are also very important. The kind of captions which you give to a photograph should be able to highlight what you're trying to communicate. Because a lot of times you might see something in a photograph which may not be so obvious to the others. So you might as well caption it in a way which is powerful and reaches out. So here is the first example. Now this little bird is a very odd looking bird. It's called the Great Thikni. And this is again from Chambal Murena in Madhya Pradesh. And you can see that uh, the, you know, they, they look normal, fine. They're looking in the camera and I was on a boat at that time and the boat was very tiny. So it kept wobbling and there it was. And I was just waiting. I thought there was something fishy. I just felt there was something else there. And I waited, the boat you know, went a little ahead and this is what I saw. You see that small little chick there? That was their family, the family portrait of these birds. They're also not very common, they're rarely seen. And as you can see, they live in reed beds or shingles, that is the area which they normally uh, inhabit. And that is where you understand that these birds show all the kind of emotions which humans do. Because by the time, all the time when I was there, you know, in the, fort, in the boat, very clo close to them, the parents did not leave the kid at all. They were, you know, looking at me watchfully, making sure that I move out of the, out of the way and they were kept staring at me. Whereas this little chick, it had, it had no uh, fear or inhibition. It kept tumbling here and there. But these two, uh, the, you know, mom and dad were very protective of it. So this is a story which we can tell through photographs. There's another one. Here's from Nagar Hole in Karnataka. And you can see that these are spotted deer, the cheetal. There was a huge, uh, you know, herd of these uh, deer and they were peacefully, you know, looking at me, feeding, you know, everything was, seemed fine. They were at peace. They were calm. But suddenly they, you know, sort of uh, looked here and there, their ears were all erect and they bolted off, they ran off. And why do you think that could have happened? Well, we were all so sure that this, what could be the reason? And this is the reason. There was a tigress hiding in the bushes and it came out, you know, lunging at them. And because of that, the deer quickly ran away into the forest. And here, this, this was probably one of my first shots of a tiger. And uh, the beautiful golden color, obviously, you know, fascinates so many of us that the, the beautiful grandeur of the tiger, which very few people can escape. Here's another shot. As you can see, my hands were trembling. I was so excited. I could hardly take a photograph and it's a blurred photo, but then that was my first photo. So I could, I wanted to share this. And that also, again, can communicate your story. Here's another, it's called Mother's Love. And here you see a lesser whistling duck with at least seven uh, little young ones. As you can see, they were all in a line in a pond you know, following their mom very duly, and mom was teaching them how to swim, how to feed, you know, very uh, poignant moment. And suddenly, this happened. 
there were two purple swamp hens which were right at the edge of the pond and they were sort of eyeing at these little kids and you can see that the kids are trying to complain to the mom mom please save us what are these you know uh, uh, you know strange looking birds doing to me and you can see that mother is responding with anger it kept screaming it kept quacking and uh, you know uh, trying to scare off these two uh, purple swamp hens so again this shows that what kind of emotions run through animals it's not very different what would a mother do when you have strangers trying to uh, you know hurt the children you would scream you would shout you would make sure that the, the the intruder walks away so this is exactly what another photo story can be and this of course is uh, my favorite bird i i i just cannot get over this it is called the lesser florican and this bird is found uh, again a very endangered bird it is from the same family as the great indian bustard and again it's a very rare bird about 1800 of them as per recent estimates and this uh, uh, has been taken uh, near ajmer in rajasthan so there's a small video which i'll show and the video will tell you what this bird does in its mating ritual and you'll see and there you go so the bird jumps up from the grass does a triple flutter with its wings and goes down again people missed it i'll quickly share it again here it is so one two and there you go <laughs> and it makes a small sound as well so the lesser florican this is the bird this is how it looks like it has a black kind of body with a very interesting crest on its head and it has a very interesting ritual in the grass grasslands during the monsoon time and i wrote an article on it which was published in the hindu and this is an another example to show how you can write and make sure that people know about these species many of us don't know about them and they're you know running away to, into extinction so at least we should know about it and we should do something about it preferably in those areas where you know that these birds are so for instance the lesser florican used to be found across they can across the uh, you know northern plains and now it's not really seen anywhere Uh, and the, because the grasslands are gradually shrinking shrinking most of grasslands have been converted into agricultural land and that is why this poor little bird doesn't find enough space to live or to survive so this bird is not really lesser than none and even though it's called lesser florican i don't think it's lesser than any other bird here is the sky of falcons and this is also a very interesting bird called the amur falcon and the amur falcon uh, if some of you might have read in your geography books amur is a river in russia and this bird comes from russia stops over in india for you know a couple of weeks and then goes to south africa for its uh, uh, you know feeding grounds and then again goes back to russia in the uh, summer season so uh, this photograph has been taken in nagaland and as you can see that the sky is full of these tiny little things which look like you know wasps or bees but it is actually birds a huge number and this is how they look like uh, the one which is flying is the uh, male and the one which is on the twig is called the, is a female and they're very pretty raptors they don't look like you know birds of prey and the entire sky was full of their sound and nagaland of course was the, the trip itself was a very interesting uh, trip it took me about 16 hours to reach there but i i was just there for a couple of hours just to capture this beautiful moment of of those birds you know flooding the sky and and then i came back again again another 16 hours but those two three hours spent there with the birds were magical so this is how amur falcons uh, fascinate and their story is also very interesting this story was also published in savers magazine and their story is also very interesting because initially in nagaland these birds used to be shot down they used to be hunted and this was very common about 10 years back and uh, you know people were they used to think that there are so many number doesn't really matter we can hunt them so they were hunt, hunted in hundreds and their meat was sold and uh, in the market whenever their breeding season was sorry whenever their migration season was and uh, many of these birds were you know killed but then gradually because of local local efforts and a lot of bird watchers like you know which we used to go there and conservationists which used to tell to, to the communities that these birds are very uh, you know endangered and they they don't have to be killed so what they did was they told the the local people that why don't you start ecotourism which means you tell people that these birds are found here in these areas you take them and they'll give you money for that you learn much more than selling their meat and that's exactly what happened so so these kind of models can be encouraged all across the country where where you feel that you know the birds or or particular wildlife is in danger you should ensure that the local community gets involved and hopefully get some kind of remuneration some kind of incentive because ultimately there is some kind of uh, cost benefit analysis which we need to do and all we all we need to understand is that economy and ecology both need to go hand in hand and this is one example where both the economy did not suffer as well as ecology revived so this is an example again 
of a story. And here's another one. This tower taller, towers taller than trees is a small, as you can see, probably I'll have to magnify this a little bit. There's a bird here and this huge bird is, is called the black neck stalk. Again, this is not really common, it's endangered. And as you can see in the background, there's a lot of activity. There's a tower, the, the tel uh, telecom communications, etc. A lot of things happening. And these birds are normally build nests on the topmost trees, the very tall trees like these, the palm trees. And you'll see that the, the nest is there. It's actually feeding its young one. And they use these nests every year. But what happens when the city comes closer and closer? The city noises come closer, the pollution increases. There's a lot of you know, um, uh, toxicity in the air, et cetera. So these birds have to flee. The, the water you know, next to them, again, becomes dirty and they're not able to feed. So they ultimately have to leave this place and you know, search other places. And you know, there will be a time uh, you know, where there won't be any places left. So what happens to these birds? So this is again a story which you're trying to communicate that, okay, look how, even though it's comfortable there, but the story, but the, the you know, the city is ultimately approaching the, the green area and eventually one day would happen when the, the, the area is gone. So what happens next, right? And uh, there's another one called the no cause for cheer. And this interesting bird is called the cheer pheasant. Again, it's a very endangered bird. And this is in Manila in Uttarakhand. And as you can see that there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a car which is approaching. So I was on the road and we were waiting for this bird to come up. It's a magnificent creature, beautiful tail, the sight, you know, and, and uh, it looks amazing. And uh, so here it was just about to cross the road on the other side. But because the car came in speeding, you know, honking, bird got disturbed and it had to go back to where it, you know, it was initially was. And this kind of disturbance unnecessarily scares them. It affects them. You know, it, it, it might affect their survival. It might affect their uh, reproduction. It might affect their, um, you know, very existence. So this example also shows that how human interference can actually uh, you know, impact creatures. Uh, this is an example of a story which is out, uh, outside India. And uh, some of you might have heard of some place called Papua New Guinea. And the Papua New Guinea has these amazing birds called the birds of paradise. There are about 40 of them. And each bird has very interesting uh, you know, feathers. It has very interesting way of speaking, its, its sound, and it has a very interesting dance. So we look at this dance and you tell me if he or he qualifies as a great dancer. This, by the way, is the Western Parotia. And it will bow before starting. There you go. It bows, takes a bow, and then it starts dancing. And on the top of the branch, you'll see a female. The female is checking out the male, whether its moves are all fine. You know, is he able to dance well? Is he fit? And you can see it's shaking its head and you know, throwing off its move and it has a skirt kind of thing around its feathers. And this, yes, is, an, is a bird. So there's another female which is joined on the background, if you can see, and there it goes, you know, showing off its dance moves. So there are two females which are spotting the male, trying to understand and the, and the wings fluttering. That means, yes, you've got the moves, you're doing the right job, you are a great dancer. So that's how it is. So even, even birds have a, have a communication which we may not even really think about. And, you know, and it, may be, it may just escape our eyes, but here's one example. And this is how the Western Perotia, the same bird, looks like you know, in, a, in a blurred kind of uh, ghostly kind of photograph. It doesn't look like a normal bird. And here it is. And yes, it belongs to the crow family. So you can see how different it is, but it is actually from the, the, the family of crows. And this is another example called the superb bird of paradise. And just look at what it does, calling out there. So did you see, it has a yellow throat and a blue kind of chest, very different, very, very incredible. And what you haven't seen is of course, even I couldn't, I missed it. There's a very interesting dance, which you could probably Google it later or see in David Attenborough's uh, you know, documentary, where it dances in a, in a mind blowing way. So these kind of videos also can show what kind of amazing uh, creatures we have in this world and what we need to do to save them. And speaking of saving, we'll talk a bit about photography ethics. This might look boring, but is extremely important. I'll quickly run through it. So, so the, what are these do's and don'ts which you need to do? You need to dress appropriately. Don't wear bright colored clothes. These animals, these creatures are very sensitive to color. So if you need, you can wear you know, dull colored, brown or camouflage kind of colors. This is really important because they don't see you as a threat. They look okay, they, they feel that, okay, this is part of the forest. He or she won't hurt me really, right? 
you need to preserve the habitat make sure that you're not cutting down any trees or, or, or disturbing the habitat trying to uh, you know pollute etc make sure that when you are going if there's a place where you know that there's a breeding or nesting going on don't disturb that place because it's very very sensitive so you might have heard a lot of people saying that if you touch a nest the bird uh, abandons the nest and it's not able to take care of its children so don't uh, go unnecessarily close to them if possible use a silent shutter which means don't use your mobiles or uh, you know cameras with a, a, a loud sound try to uh, silent them playback now what's playback you might have heard of it playback is basically when you um, when you're in the forest or in any kind of place you uh, sort of increase you you sort of uh, play certain kind of sounds which attract the birds or which attract animals now this is fine you know in a in a sense where the kind of uh, creatures are having a good population it's it's okay but this is not really uh, recommended for those which are endangered because then what happens is that they might get uh, you know they might get curious about the sound and they might uh, leave their own partners or leave their own families and think that where the sound is coming from and this is a fact so playback should be limited and if you discover a place which is uh, having some very interesting wildlife don't necessarily have you know blurt it out in social media you can possibly post a photograph or something but don't share the exact location because then again what is going to happen is a lot of people will keep flooding there and then the creature will get disturbed so there's no point unnecessarily you know disturbing the creature try to keep those places hidden and maintain distance as i said don't unnecessarily you know venture too close because then they get frightened and they might just abandon that area and uh, unnecessarily get stressed follow the law so if the law says do not smoke or do not litter or do not uh, you know uh, eat or do not throw etc do not feed the animals do that because the law is created there for a purpose and if you don't follow the law well you might find yourself in a tough spot caption responsibly and captioning as i said caption means basically a very short story for what your photograph is communicating so as you saw that we discussed these photo stories and there was a very small four to five word caption it could be a longer caption as well it could be 25 words for instance and all of these captions essentially communicate in a brief uh, idea of what you're trying to say through your photograph and the last of course is think like wildlife so if you are you know intruders are coming to your place how would you feel that's exactly what you need to do that when when you are interacting with wildlife they are pretty much operating on the same kind of reactions which we do they are not really very different they would uh, you know be defensive if you are uh, sort of uh, you know uh, intruding there they would become scared if you are trying to hurt them and that's exactly what we need to be sure of that their reactions are very much similar to us and there are certain don'ts don't distress wildlife that is don't unnecessarily uh, try to tease them or make sounds don't crowd that don't need to have a many number of people going there if possible go in a straight line so what they'll see is that there is one or two persons and they'll not be able to see through the line but if you're in a crowd which is uh, like a you know a random kind of uh, arrangement then they'll see that there are multiple threats so they might you know get stressed and go away from that place don't chase again because of photograph some people have this tendency of going behind the subject and trying to capture the photo again that is not really the right thing to do don't litter which i have already mentioned don't manhandle so you might have some kind of interesting lizards or or or, or kind of frogs or maybe some kind of a snake or insect and you might be tempted to put it in your hand and take a take a picture so normally we, we shouldn't do that because if there are two reasons you might get uh, infected or bitten by it that of course is the one part the selfish part and the second is that you might have certain fungus or bacteria in your skin which they may not even be uh, you know exposed to earlier and because you touch them they'll get exposed to that and they might uh, their uh, the entire population might collapse because of that you never know so it's always best to let, let them be and distance uh, is very important while taking pictures don't provoke them or bait them that's again very similar to uh, distressing them so don't try to give them food as we talked about that food giving trying to give them food is wrong and don't try to provoke them just in order to sort of try to throw stone or something that is all really not good how would you feel if somebody chucks stones at you you would get you know freaked out so that's exactly what you need to make sure don't feed that's again the same thing don't speed so especially when you're in a national uh, park or a wildlife sanctuary and if you're in a car then make sure that your car or your vehicle is not speeding unnecessarily because there's a possibility that you know since you're in a, a protected area a creature could just come in your path and die and you know besides that they, they speeding is never really a healthy uh, habit for yourself as well as as well as for others 
no noise that is don't uh, don't unnecessarily um, you know play music for instance or or honk that's not recommended and no flash which we spoken about earlier that you shouldn't have uh, unnecessarily very bright uh, torch lights or flashlights which are uh, you know uh, harmful for these creatures so that's mostly the do's and don'ts and uh, that we'll have a quick poll again so that you know you can uh, engage and uh, i'll just quickly take a pause here and uh, yeah so let's see uh, how many pa people participate in this one right so again people need to go to menti.com uh, those who have just joined or those who have joined later uh, uh, then they might not know this, but menti, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, right? So menti.com. Okay, so we already got a response. That's good. Menti.com and you go and uh, fill up the code, which is 8599180. And the question, of course, is which animal or bird do you think must be saved urgently today? Right? So your, your responses will be recorded here and we'll see uh, what kind of responses are we getting? Yeah, somebody's written vulture. That's a good idea. Great. Right. Birds of paradise. Good. Great Indian bustard. Great. Yeah, we can have more responses. I think a lot of people, yeah, great Indian bustard is getting a lot of words. Mm -hmm. Vultures, very good. Tiger. waiting we will we'll wait for another two minutes i think people can type you need all you need to do is just type in your responses and uh, we can get your uh, yeah i think it's stopping now i think no it's, it's people are still writing great investor has a lot of words vulture has a lot of words tiger has a lot of words great Yeah, we can have some other, we have rhinoceros, sparrows. That's a good idea. Yes, sparrows are endangered too. Pangolins, that's a very good answer. Lesser florican, that's very good. Yes, and polar bears, that's also a great answer. Many, many examples. That's, that's wonderful. It's, it's great to see such a variety of answers coming in. And that shows that, okay, the, you know, kids, very exposed to you know different kinds of creatures and what kind of challenges. Yes, the sparrow, that's great. Sparrow, the numbers have increased. Wonderful. We'll wait for another, let's say 20 seconds. People who haven't responded, they can quickly put in their uh, responses. I think two, uh, you have to name any two creatures, any two animals or birds, which you think must be saved urgently on menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M. And you the code, which is 8599-180, 8599-180. Right, so another 10, 15 seconds. Great. Giant panda, yes, that's a good answer. Flamingos. Forest Owlet, that's also an excellent example. I'm sure that the person who's written this would knows about forest owlets. That's great. Forest owlet is also a very rare, very endangered bird. Numbers are very low. Right. Great. So I think we can take a pause now. Aju, is that okay? Or should we wait for more? I think we should continue. Uh, I have taken two screenshots of this. Okay, great. Wonderful. Right. Perfect. So thank you so much, everybody. The responses are still coming, but we have some time constraint as well. So we'll take a pause here now. And uh, we're closing the voting now. Thank you for your responses. Thank you. Wonderful. So here we are.
right so now we'll continue with the uh, interactive session as well and uh, i'll just quickly share the screen just a second yeah okay uh, aju is it visible uh, the screen the um, ppt yes yes right so uh, the, we have an assignment for you know people for everybody that we can uh, work on and before that there's some you know the the obligatory uh, social media um, you know kind of uh, addresses you can have these handles uh, twitter linkedin insta facebook gmail whichever you want you can just save it you probably take a screenshot or something and you can uh, reach out to me uh, anytime and now we'll move, move at the assignment so your assignment which we'll be giving today and uh, this has to be done by you and uh, this has to be done by tomorrow because this will be discussed in the workshop tomorrow so here's a assignment the assignment is you're supposed to click a photograph right and a single photo must be submitted by each participant on the theme of environment biodiversity or wildlife so it's a broad area you can whatever kind of photograph you want to take you can click but make sure that you're not going anywhere without your parents permission if you are a kid so make sure that your teacher or your parent knows where you're going possibly you should be monitored and uh, don't go alone and otherwise i'll be one to blame and the second one is that the photograph must be original you should not copy those photographs from the net or from some other place click any photograph right this is this is how we learn and no plagiarism is acceptable so make sure that you're not copying any photograph right should be your own photo and should be clicked from now till tomorrow so if you're photographing wildlife make sure that you know capturing not uh, you're not uh, clicking captive animals which means are uh, animals from a zoo or animals uh, which are otherwise put in a cage or something they should be uh, you know uh, highlighted as it, as they are available in the wild or even in the city hmm? and unless you are trying to highlight a particular conservation issue so that is one and uh, photographic entries must must either tell a story or if it's a reflection piece then the text or caption attached to it must make sense of what the story is in relation to so this is exactly what i told you about that the caption or the story which you want to write so there are both options available you have to compulsorily write a caption which is a, a maximum of 25 words and you can also write a short story about what it is right uh, a caption that fits the best but not more than 25 words as, as i've said the caption should explain the link with environmental sustainability or the problem or the issue so you could have a pollution related issue you could have a sustainability related issue you could have uh, you know it's a very broad area it doesn't have to be necessarily wildlife but any anything which is related to sustainability environment it's a broad area right but the caption should be interesting uh, you know you should write something which communicates what kind of uh, photograph you have taken and the photos must be submitted digitally as jpg png tiff format uh, with a resolution not less than 150 300 dpi resolution uh, you know typically lesser than that becomes very garbled so we're not able to see so make sure that your photo are um, you know in these formats and you can send those across and uh, the chat box will mention the link at which you can send these uh, photographs so i think it's a google form all you need to do is submit your entries there and uh, we'll see if we can you know give some prizes also i think that's on the table maybe uh, the top 3 or top 2 or something of that sort we'll see uh, what we can do and the best entries will uh, you know try we'll, we'll we'll give them some interesting goodies right so make sure that your submissions are uh, sent at the link below is that okay right then okay now we have questions so i hope you have uh, you, you can probably take a screenshot of this uh, you know uh guidelines so that you don't forget what kind of things uh you have to take care of and uh and now we can open for questions so i hope uh we sort of yeah we, we pretty much completed in time and we can have questions and you need to be there tomorrow all of you who attended today it's a request that you should attend tomorrow as well so questions uh arju how do we uh you know get these questions done uh, oh, yeah. can i close so we yeah. have few questions in the q and a section okay great so i'm i'm stopping the sketch uh, the uh, screening is that okay the screen yeah. sharing yes right okay and it's available um, aju ma'am has put your uh, link on the chat box so everybody make uh, sure that you have the link because without that you'll not be able to submit the photos and the deadline yes very important the deadline is 1 pm by tomorrow so by 1 pm you need to submit any kind of photograph you can probably go out in the evening right now or it, uh, 
go out early in the morning or some time which you feel is comfortable to you and click some photo and you know uh, submit them right that's it yeah so questions please tell me uh, so starting with few uh, hmm. which camera would be the best for clicking these type of pictures Right, Aditya, I think it's Aditya. Yeah, I can see the question now. Yes, great. So Aditya, well, as I said, the camera is, uh, you know, you can have a variety of cameras. You can have, uh, you know, uh, your mobile cameras. They can click very interesting photos, especially macros. You can have DSLRs, you can have digital cameras. The, the choice is endless. It all depends on how much you're willing to, uh, you know, how seriously you're planning to go into it. And what's your budget like? Of course, that's an important criteria. So uh, because of that, you can, you know, de depending on that, you can choose. And we can, you can reach out to me later. We can discuss if you have some options in mind. We'll take up that because I'm sure that's a very common question that many of you might might be having. You know, right? Uh, okay. So Aditya was here. Uh, just a second. There's a there's a place called Answered. We've already looked looked at those questions. Is that is that fine, Aju? Yes, yes, yes. That is fine. Okay, wonderful. Right. So then, uh, do we go right at the bottom? Uh, this five to seventeen. All oh, right. So Vishan, Vishan Sharma had asked. So the shutter speeds there is lesser the blur. Yes, Vishan. So if you have a faster shutter speed, which means that if you have a very fast shutter speed, it means that the blur would be less. So that means for the, the amount of time you're giving. So if you have a more amount of time, that means the the shutter is open for a longer time. That means the object will move very comfortably and your uh, the object, the uh, photo will be blurred, but the motion blur will be there. But if you have a very short shutter speed, like it quickly opens and closes, then you will not have that motion blur. So that is how it is. Uh, Himanjali Gud asks, hi, I have a doubt that how horizon is being captured. Right, so horizon is nothing but the place where two various, uh, you know, colors meet. You could have the sky meeting the land, you could have the sky meeting the sea, sea meeting land, you could have a branch. The horizon in this case could be very wide. It is a dividing line, which sort of uh, divides your photo naturally into uh, you know, some parts. So, so depending on that, the horizon can be fixed uh, you know, on those on the lines which I talked about. So I hope that's fine. Himanjali's uh, answered. Uh, can you repeat the bird's name, Akshat? Uh, which bird are we talking about? 423, I'm not too sure. Uh, Akshat, if you're uh, there, you could probably I don't know, unmute him maybe, Akshat, if he's still there. And Himanjali is also asking, what is the name of the bird? So uh, it was the one which you clicked from Himanjali, I guess the bird with green color. The bird with uh, blue in color. The start, yeah, in the starting. Right. Place. So yeah, that was the orange build blue magpie. Orange build blue magpie, M-A-G-P-I-E. Right. I hope that answers Himanjali your question as well. Right. Then Sehaj asks, is it necessary to divide the photograph in nine parts only, or we can divide it even further? Sehaj, so the idea is rule of thirds. So what is this uh, dividing to nine uh, is actually the rule of thirds. You're essentially having these divisions because the one third, two third rule is, is what is important. So actually it is neither lesser than nine nor more than nine. It has to be exactly nine if you're following the rule of thirds. If you're not, then well, the, you know, the option is entirely open to you. But if you are, then just nine. Okay, Love asks, uh, how will we see that our photograph is fine or not as the lines don't come in normal devices? So we would see that in, yes, right. Good question, Love. So the idea is, Love, this comes with practice. So these lines, as I said, they don't have to be exact. So what you can do is when you're clicking, just try to make sure that the one third, two third rule is being followed. That is uh, approximately, it should be on the one third side, either left or right or top or bottom, depending on where you're framing the object. And that's where, uh, you know, um, it, it would be. What you could do is, Initially, when you're uh, beginning photograph uh, photography, then you can uh, you know keep those photos in your uh, on your desktop, make those lines, and see that how close you were. So you'll see that by practice, you'll understand that the rule of third is naturally followed. You don't have to uh, see those lines. So initially, it used to be very difficult for me also, but now you know when I click, the framing naturally happens. You have an approximate idea of how far you have to be. I hope that answers your question. Now. Then Darshil asked uh, why there is a difference in the quality of photo that is captured on phones. Well, because there are a couple of reasons. One is, of course, the sensor. Uh, the kind of sensors which cameras use is way more stronger, way more uh, you know uh, sensitive than the ones which in phone. But nowadays, even phones have very, very good sensors coming up. So you can have excellent photos from your phone as well. And uh, it should not be a limitation. And it's only the limitation becomes when you have objects which are very far away from you. That is where the phone becomes slightly difficult because you can't zoom in too much. 
but even for that there's a very interesting uh, you know object which a lot of people might uh, find very useful there is something called clip lens and clip lens can be clipped on your camera on your mobile phone and you have different types of clip lens you have telephoto lens which helps you magnify an object which is very far and they're very very cheap you can easily order them from amazon but make sure they are of decent quality make sure that your you know, reviews and uh, uh, you know those things are taken care of and make sure if your kids then your, your mom and dad's permission is taken well beforehand right so you have those telephoto lens or you could have a fish eye lens uh, which is uh, you know having a huge kind of uh, um, uh, um, area or depth, depth of field and that can have very interesting kind of uh, photographs there also and you have macro lens also you know for instance if you want to capture some uh, object very close to you then how do you zoom in because uh, after a certain while uh, the phone camera cannot capture that right so all of that can be used by these clip lens mobile clip lens and they can be just clipped onto your mobile phone and you can click various uh, photographs and entirely uh, explore a very interesting kind of range of possibilities and if you like them then maybe you can go and you know buy a full fledged camera right so that's how you can uh, experiment mahir uh, asks how to make a background blur right mahir so uh, the important thing is the more distance you have between your your object the one which you are capturing and the background the more chances of it being blurred would be right that is naturally what uh, you know your uh, cameras do they typically have this uh, automatic uh, focal length which means that anything which is beyond that focal length will not be uh, sharp and automatically becomes blurred but you have many uh, you know various different uh, mobile phones having this um effect of blurring out the background that is not really the real the actual blur which you're talking about because that works on a very different way it just what it basically does is blurs out everything uniformly but blur happens as you move away from the camera more and more blur happens so that gradual uh, you know uh, uh, sort of um, uh, blurring is not really visible in a lot of mobile phones which are doing or giving that effect of blur so you have to be very careful that when you're using using blur it should be uh, used in a very uh, creative way it doesn't spoil the originality of the image right so siddhant asks how do you capture macro without scaring animals which point and shoot camera do you recommend and what do you decided okay great so good question siddhant so well macro uh, typically used to be a major problem initially siddhant uh, especially because butterflies and these kind of uh, you know creatures are very skittish they the, the moment you approach they they fly but with patience you go very slowly to them the first thing you need to do is don't move too much you know uh, you sit down at their level because normally they are you know on plants or something so you sit down at their level and then gradually take the mobile phone or your camera lens very close slowly and just see how uh, how close you can go before it flying away so this is this will come to a practice and you'll see that different uh, insects have different thresholds so butterflies when they're dying you know drying their wings or you know sunning themselves they might just be like a statue when you might go very close to them and they may not move and you might have certain beetles which don't move but you might have certain flies which would fly away very suddenly or dragonflies they are very skittish but they have a very interesting uh, you know uh, property dragonflies they try to come back to the same spot so they'll they'll fly away then they'll you know come back again so if you're patient enough your you know subject will be there so that is one thing which you're not scaring point and shoot you have i think p900 nikon is a very good uh, you know camera which is point and shoot others of course there are lot of lot of them available you can probably contact me you know separately and i'll give you an example there and the third question was um what was the third question of what i think it's gone in the answered tab just a second uh yeah i think it might just be here okay it's not there um uh, so now i think i've lost the third question uh is it possible to get that again no it's gone uh yeah uh, i think it was choosing decide? places Yeah. How do you decide the places? Yes, places. Yes, yes, I remember. So yeah, the well, um, you can start off by you know going to places which are uh, near you, or you can start by going to national parks and sanctuary, uh, sanctuary wildlife sanctuaries which are near you, because why I'm saying near you because it's easier to understand, it's easier to go there, and when you're initially going, uh, you you tend to get a little bored or tired, you know, because you not see everything as 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 interesting as it looks right now, because a lot of times you might just go there and not see what you expect to see. For instance, tigers. a lot of people go to tiger sanctuaries and their assumption is okay we'll definitely see a tiger but they don't see that but that is never disappointed me because whenever i am going to a wildlife sanctuary or a place like that i am entirely open to the idea of uh, any kind of creature coming because you believe in me or not when you're uh, you know opening your eyes and ears and listening very intently you will see certain things or sights or behaviors of animals which you would not have imagined and they could be very uh, you know common animals 
so so that kind of thing you have an open mind that is the first thing you need to do that you don't expect too much and go there as a as a you know person who who's who's who is curious who wants to learn more and you'll see that the that they'll never disappoint you the, the you know the these areas and nearby areas you can you know join these facebook groups and there are lots of whatsapp groups which are uh, local communities which are you know sort of uh, bird watchers or wildlife uh, enthusiasts in that area and they can give you, you know good uh, good advice and how to uh, go there's a website called ebird ebird.com and uh, there you can check your own locality and you can see that which which areas are there having high bio uh, diversity especially in birds right so i hope that answers your questions then mehak asks uh, does editing a part of the photo has importance how do we yes mehak that's a very good question see editing the idea the basic philosophy of editing it is that your natural or the originality of the image should not be disturbed right so for instance as i showed you that leopard photograph which had a twig on its face which meant that i i could have edited that right photoshop does that you can remove that and make that uh, face look totally uh, the same color as the body but i didn't want to do that so editing is uh, limited to let's say cropping you make sure you can crop it to a certain extent make sure that it falls in the uh, rule of thirds that that's what you can do you can do minimum editing let's say by increasing the contrast with uh, tweaking a little bit of color uh, increasing the exposure these are some basic tweaking which you can do but i would recommend not doing too much of editing right it's always best to uh, try to capture the photo as it is and present it the way it is and plus uh, if you're entering into many photography competitions for instance they expressly forbid you to do any kind of uh, you know editing especially um, you know very different editing which can uh, which can which can entirely change the, the entire perception of the original photograph so the heck that i hope is the then vishank asks sir you're making such risks in taking pictures of the animals do you have some security while taking these pictures yes vishank that's a good idea this always a very important to have some kind of uh, you know a, a local person with you or a, or a guide or a friend but always remember that uh, don't go in a large group you know going in a group of uh, two to three is ideal it's perfect so you can have your best friends going with you and you can have a local guide who knows the area who knows the dangers and uh, it is recommended that you don't go and trading off into a area which you have not gone before so try keeping to the uh, you know road or try keeping to the path which is already there and that helps so there's not much danger and wildlife doesn't really uh, you know attack unless you you sort of do something wrong so you know that way then mahiraj uh, how to pick the background for capturing photos that is entirely your option you could have um, let's say a, a, a very drab brown colored bird and you could have a very pink kind of flower in the behind that could be a great photograph or vice versa you could have a very colorful bird and you could have a green background uh, you know contrasting with it so that entirely depends on your choice and the background and of course all of that the, the, the there can be very many elements which you can try to incorporate in the background so that uh, sort of answers the question background can be very different for you know kind of photographs shubha asked um what is the best time to click a picture okay that's a great question so well if it's wildlife i would recommend normally it's uh, early morning or early uh, or or late evening that is when the animals or birds are most active but if you are taking any kind of other photograph non wildlife or environment for instance then any any other time is okay normally what happens is afternoons is not a good time because the sun is right on top of your subject and typically the photo the, the shadows cause um, you know that the the, the uh, object might have very different kind of shadows falling on its own self so that it spoils uh, the colors of the photo so afternoons normally is not a good time but again it depends you know you could have some kind of subject which is uh, probably best suited to be picked in a, in the afternoons so you can have that but normally for wildlife uh, animals birds etc it is early uh, morning and uh, which is around 6 7 or uh, late evening right uh, nyasha sir was a photo of the butterfly clicked from the opposite direction of the sun yes uh, the, the the blue bottle was uh, you know uh, clicked with the opposite direction which means that the sun was behind the butterfly that's why you could see the shadow of the butterfly falling in front of it so that's why the colors of the butterfly showed up so that's how um, you know you can have backlit photography Uh, how can one change shutter speed and aperture uh, in mobile okay so this is a limited feature this may or may not be available in your uh, mobile phone because it depends if you have a kind of professional kind of phone which has a lot of uh, features it might be there otherwise it's it's totally fine you have many different modes you can experiment with those and not necessarily have to experiment with aperture or shutter speed uh, with your mobile phone because a lot of it is inbuilt and uh, the auto mode for instance has all those features automatically adjusting so you don't have to really worry about that and uh, initially when you are you know using your phones make it uh, focus more on the story and focus more on the uh, background 
focus more on the subject rather than getting clarity. Clarity is something which can we, we can work later, but the composition of the photo is very important. So that can start off with mobile phones also. Uh, what is iOS? It's actually ISO, uh, Savani asked me. And ISO is uh, nothing but it's actually International Standards Organization, ISO. It, it, because of that, they have this kind of uh, minimum num number of uh, you know, um, specifications for a camera sensor. So ISO basically measures how sensitive your camera sensor is to light. And if you have your ISO uh, increased, which means that, the, that you have increased the sensitivity. So this is more uh, relevant in low light conditions. And if you have a very bright sunny day, or if a bright uh, background like snow, for example, if you're shooting in the Himalayas, then you could have a lower ISO so that uh, the glare of the uh, background doesn't spoil the image. Sahaj asks, is it necessary to divide the picture in nine parts only? Yes, Sahaj, as I've answered, it is necessary to divide it in nine only if you're uh, you know, following the uh, rule of thirds. Which app is best in phone for clicking beautiful photos? Well, uh, Midhanj, you can click, uh, you, there are many apps. I don't name any particular one, but uh, you can you, you use your camera to click photos. And then you can edit using, I think Picasa is one good app which can help. And uh, there are many of them available, really. The, the market is flooded with the kind of apps. So you, whichever suits you, whichever you think is easy. So don't go for something which is too complicated if you're starting off and uh, just, just see if the results are good. So as I said, don't focus too much on editing, uh, just basic editing you need to do. Right, Mithaj. Mayuri asks, which kind of lens a person should always have in his or her kit? Okay, that's that's a great question, Mayuri. So that depends what kind of uh, photographer are you. So if you are looking at uh, wildlife, which is typically high up in trees and very far away, then you would need a you know a larger lens or a telephoto lens. And if you are more of a landscape person, then you could have a lower focal length, and you know you could uh, experiment with that. So it depends entirely on what kind of uh, you know lens you are looking for. Although for a versatile person who's you know looking for both, let's say landscape or um, you know um, part of telephoto lens you can have a lens which has a wide range so you, you can have let's say a range which is uh, having a low focal length to the higher you know you have these uh, com combination lenses which they call so you can have a, a variety of focal lengths there so i think that uh, that answers your question Mayuri. Uh, Aditi, what will be done in tomorrow's workshop? Well, tomorrow we'll be covering, as I said, the, the um, you know there'll be certain topics which, which we're covering and tomorrow we'll be discussing on what kind of photos you've taken and what we can do uh, to improve them. And if there, if there are any outstanding photos we can discuss, like, you know, these are the kind of things which you're looking for in an environmental photograph or in wildlife photography. And that's what we'll be doing for. It will be more interactive and we'll be talking about it. Saket asks, is Tukan a rare bird? Well, Tukans are not really rare because they're found in a lot of numbers in the uh, Amazonian rainforest, but they're very interesting birds. So, uh, so, so, but the Amazon itself is under danger. So that way you could call them endangered. But if you look at Google, I think they'll not probably be in danger. They're least concerned as of now. But toucans are very interesting, very interesting birds. And you have something similar in India called hornbills. They're pretty much uh, similar families. Flash lighting directly hit bird's eye or animal's eye during taking photos so they become permanently blind or temporary. Uh, Om, well, they don't become permanently blind. They become temporarily, but the temporariness uh, or the blindness uh, which, which they um, experience can go for a long time, you know. So, they, so that entire night they could be they could be um, disoriented. They may not be able to focus on um, how to go to another branch. And if there's a predator or some kind of hunter behind them, then they may not be able to see properly. So that is why uh, flashing or you know uh, torching right in front of them is not a good idea. Then Arav, how do we have a sharp focus? Uh, yes, Arav, that's a that's a good question. A lot of people have this um, you know problem. So, well, depends on what kind of instrument you're using. If you're using a mobile phone, merely clicking on the subject, make sure that that particular subject, you know, gets in focus. And if you're using cameras, then half pressing the camera, not fully pressing it. Fully pressing it releases a shutter and your photo will be clicked. Half pressing it focuses, uh, you know, uh, provided it's on autofocus mode. So that is one thing. If it is a manual focus, well, then you need to uh, manually ch change the lens of the camera and make sure that the photo is, you know, coming clearly in your uh, viewfinder. So manually, of course, is one uh, example, but then manual focus um, may or may not uh, be one's choice, depending on how uh, you know easy uh, the subject is. If it's a moving object, then manual focus is, of course, not recommended because you know your object will keep shifting. But if it's an animal which is large, like an ele elephant or something, which is coming very normally, gradually to you, then you can probably use manual focus, right? So Grishma asks, are clip lenses suitable for any kind of phone, or you need specific? No, Grishma, they are uh, available for any kind of phones. But what you can do is that when you're purchasing those uh, clip lenses, you can just see that they're compatible with the phone lenses, uh, which you have. They have a list of phones a lot of times. 
so that you can you know you can, uh, check whether your phone is compatible with the lenses but normally they are just clip lenses they can just simply be attached and all you need to do is um, physically adjust them and your work is done how do you capture photos of birds and animals without scaring them well uh, as i said um, uh, hridayanshi you need, just need to be a little fur further away you don't need to go very close to them and that's it don't make any sudden noises don't make any sudden movements just make sure that you're meeting somebody for the first time so how would you meet somebody for the first time you don't want to be like you know jump on them or you know suddenly say hi i'm you know so and so you need to be very calm just make sure that the bird or the animal is getting used to your presence and that's the best way to not scare them away and believe me when you are patient they will do wondrous things in front of you which which we, you know you may not even have imagined so all you need to be is just little patient don't move too much don't uh, create too many sounds and they'll be fine at what age did you start photography amrita i started photography around uh, 10 12 years back the, the wildlife photography but before that i used to click normal pictures you know usually but the wildlife photography was about 10 to 12 years back thank you then arvas is it that photos in the daylight are better uh, compared to photos taken at night uh, rather than having better technology well are of course as i said photograph literally means writing light photo means light graph means writing so essentially what you're doing is that you're capturing light so of course light is an advantage but when you have low light but the problem is that uh, many of the wildlife um, you know is more, most of the wildlife is not really visible at good lighting conditions as i said early morning is you know low light and late evening is also low light so that is a challenge sometimes but uh, what usually happens is that because you have good technology nowadays generally average technology has increased so low light conditions are not such a big challenge now but if you want to capture very magnificent shots of of uh, creatures uh, you know in with the high shutter speed and low light then of course you need a better technology but otherwise more or less uh, you know having much light never hurts uh, having less light is always an always a challenge if we are far away from an animal if we zoom from our phones the picture yes it gets poor now we are yes so that's true so here what we need to do is you can have those clip lenses as i said and clip lenses can help you uh, sort of get closer to the subject without physically you know uh, getting close to them or using higher or very high expensive technology that's what we can do uh, i didn't understand the rules of thirds ridhyanshi we can have another session on that basically it means that you divide the photo what you're going to take into nine equal squares and make sure that the object the, the place or the the animal or the bird or the object which you're trying to uh, click is on any of those four intersecting points that's it so it's not very difficult and all you need to make sure is that your uh, object is not bang in the center of the photo it should be either on the left or on the right slightly on the top or on the bottom so basically one third two third ratio that's how it is right how to blur backgrounds for macro shots mayuri uh, in fact a lot of times these uh, lenses which i was talking about they are very very specific focal lengths so automatically they'll be blurring out the background so that shouldn't be a problem Nyasa asks, "How is a camera of iPhone for taking these kind of pictures?" Well, I don't have an iPhone, but I'm sure that iPhone a lot of people use. And yes, iPhone or any other phone which has good cameras can get really excellent photos, uh, especially landscapes. Uh, you know, with very interesting lighting. Vidhan says, uh, "Which camera do you use?" Well, it's right behind me. It's called Nikon D850. I use the Nikon uh, 500mm prime lens. That's my gear, my favorite gear. Uh, Navya asks, uh, "Can we leave now?" Yes, you can, Navya. I think I believe the session has ended. and jpg and raw pradeep asks well jpg is a, a very common format which is easy it, it is a compressed format and raw is an uncompressed format so what normally happens is when you're taking a photo uh, pradeep it uh, it it takes a lot of information which is uh, you know dis uh, so or, or discarded when you're taking a jpg raw preserves those images all of that data and when you're editing that photo using advanced uh, techniques let's say like photoshop then you can use uh, raw uh, images for better editing it preserves the integrity of the image mansi says tomorrow also webinar is regarding the same topic a uh, similar topic and the topic sub topics are going to be courses careers in wildlife uh, we'll be talking about um, you know uh, the assignment which you've done today maybe some videos or something we'll try to see what uh, kind of you know topics we can have tomorrow and uh, tavisha asks a uh, wildlife photography a good profession yes it is a good profession provided uh, you're on the right track and tavisha will be talking a bit about this tomorrow so we'll you have to join tomorrow and get an answer to that question navya asks is clicking photo at midnight is better well depending on light if you have entirely um, you know poor lighting but the object is let's say an owl you have no option you have to use a external light but again keeping in mind that it doesn't spoil the uh, animal's sight mansi asks recording well uh, aju will help answer that i'm not sure i think yes, we yes we okay. have put this recording on our youtube channel right right 
Right, Sanvi, I think uh, uh, it says, how do you blur the background? It looks good. Well, as I said, Sanvi, you need, just need to focus on the uh, you know image and depending on what kind of instrument you're using, a lot of it depends on that. So if you're using a phone, all you need to do is click on the uh, object and automatically the background will get blurred. If you're using a camera, then you need to show, make sure that the object is as far away from the background as possible. Uh, people using a ring of light, does that help? Uh, ring of light, well, yes, but that's typically for human portraits more. I don't think animal portraits is going to be uh, very uh, you, know, you know different, but I think that's how um, heck, a lot of people use ring lights because it gives a very nice rounded light. It doesn't shine you know, on a particular you know particular area. So a ring of light gives a uh, you know a uniform lighting towards the subject. That's why it's uh, it's considered the best thing for uh, preferred these days. Right. So any more questions? I think we've answered pretty much um, a lot of questions. Yes, we had a number of questions and you have answered all of them. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Right. So I think that's about uh, it from my side. Uh, I think, um, is there anything else we need to talk about? Yes, I think, uh, Aju, you can uh, take the floor about Vire India and, you know, talk about it. Uh, any other uh, announcements you need to make? So for tomorrow's assignment, the link is there in the chat box. You can uh, copy paste the link. And also I'll be sharing this link through follow up email. So we'll be emailing you about today's uh, workshop and then you'll get this link. And uh, I had many uh, requests like you can submit more than one photograph. So of course I'll make that, uh, like I'll uh, create it accordingly so that, uh, so that you can uh, put more mm. than one photographs in that form. Right. Perfect. And yes, this recording will be there uh, on our YouTube channel and the address of YouTube channel is Wire India. I have put that in uh, chat box as well. Great. So people can check this out. And I think the the uh, the webinar link will be the same, right, Ms. Aju? Yes, yes. Webinar Great. link will be So the people same. who have joined today, you just need to use the same link to join in tomorrow at 4 p.m. And we can continue uh, the conversation tomorrow. Right. So I think, can we end the recording now? We can maybe have a session after that. Yes. Great. So this is it from our side. Uh, Ma'am, are we remaining with anything? No, I think we're good. Thank you. For okay. Great. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you so for much. taking this wonderful session. <laughs> I think it was really, um, very, very invigorating and uh, it's really a really good. Thank a lot of so. us who are not into photography will get into it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> that's great. It's yeah. wonderful to know. And you've attracted a lot of questions, I must say. Yeah, that's that's good. They're I'm still, happy that they're still going on oh. and uh, say, asking you what made you such an enthusiast of wildlife and photography. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Meg, yes. Well, uh, you know, that's how it is. It's from childhood. I used to live very close to the zoo and I used to hear these animal sounds and used to be very curious, you know, going to bed, what this, what the lion must be doing right now, what the tiger must be doing right now. <laughs> and I always had that curiosity, you know. So from a young age, you know, you sort of uh, got interested in the, in the wildlife and then photography came in later, but that's, that's how yeah. it is. <laughs> Okay, so right. for participants, we are closing the session now and we look forward to meeting you tomorrow again at the same time at four o'clock. Perfect. Uh, and wait for the email also from uh, Arzu and hopefully you have copied the link which she shared for the assignment on the chat in the chat. So do that before you leave, please. So that's it from our side. Uh, right. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you tomorrow again with the assignment. Absolutely. We have to see everybody tomorrow. Thank you so much for the participation and special thanks to CEE and YRE for, you know, giving me this opportunity to interact with so many people, especially young people who can uh, really make a difference. And uh, thank you, Madhvi, ma'am. Thank you, Aju, for all the help. And uh, we'll, we'll meet again yeah. tomorrow. And hope participants, have... yeah. Participants yeah. can leave. I think you're asking us whether we can leave. Yes, ah, yes. Participants can do. leave. Yes, yes. Please do. We'll give uh, his email ID tomorrow during hmm. the session. So please join tomorrow by him. Perfect. We have two hand raised. I'll just uh, promote them to panelists if they don't have any questions. Okay. Sure. Charvi. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, yes, I can see too. Hi, Charvi. 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 H
Hi, Chandi. You can speak now. Hmm. Thank you, ma'am. I just want to speak that uh, which camera we should use to complete the assignment. Okay, Sharvi, you can use any camera. You can use your mobile phone. You have any other camera at home. Anything which you have, anything which is available. Don't don't go buying something new. Okay, otherwise I'll be killed. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever you have with you uh, at yeah. home, your parents, yeah. uh, whoever. I mean, you have a mobile phone yeah. would be fine. Anything, okay. yeah. Any so any object. Yeah, yeah, just using whatever you learned today. Some of the kind of basic basic principles. You can take a picture. Uh, in the around the themes which have been mentioned uh, and they are very broad so you can take it uh, take that photograph any way you want to interpret the theme also so let's see how creative you get mm, absolutely okay ma'am thank you ma'am yeah right. good luck and we we'll see you good tomorrow night, arju is there anybody else Uh, I think there are about forty-five people still there. Like gradually. Yeah, people leave. are are encouraged to leave now. Hmm. Or we should close this and then rejoin. I guess. Uh, I think we should close and rejoin. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we can do that. Have a good day, sir. Great. Have a good day. You too. Here, Manchi. Purvi, I think, raised a hand suddenly. Who is it? Purvi. Purvi, yes. Okay, Purvi, go. Go ahead. You have a question, Purvi? Purvi, you can ask. You can. She can be unmuted, no? Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. Arjun, you have unmuted, no? Yes, yes. I think could be by mistake because. Mm -hmm. कर दो ना आशुष को ओके थैंक यू एवरीवन वी सी यू टुमारो या या एंड वी कैन मीट अगेन विद यू ऑल हां राइट